So welcome everyone and many thanks for joining us for this um, Catalysis Hub webinar. We're joined by um, Dr Natalie Fay from Bristol who is going to talk about computational predictions for organometallic catalysts. So I'll hand straight over to Natalie. Computational predictions um, and those work we still need to do um, and I'm going to do this in the context of the group for my own work. Um, so to get us started, hopefully the technology is not going to let me down and we can play this little video. So I, I, I thought this was quite an apt clip for um, a, an academic career and especially a research career. So you start out on the journey full of, full of delight and song um, and, and then you start to ask yourself, have we actually reached what, what we're trying to do? So there you go. Um, I think overall the, the conclusion is probably going to be we're not there quite yet, um, but, but we're certainly moving in the right direction as well. So we're making some progress towards some prediction based on computational data. Um, and what we've definitely got now and um, where my group have contributed quite a lot is we got ourselves some wheels. We, we, we can actually move forward. Um, so the wheel really consists of um, mechanistic studies, um, ligand data and ligand parameters, but also looking at substrate effects. Um, and then I'll touch today a little bit on metal effects, um, but I'm not going to go into a lot of detail with that. So all of these elements are starting to come together and are actually starting to move us forwards. So um, I'll, I'll walk you through that a little bit. Um, so let's start with mechanism. And um, one area we've done some work in is on rhodium catalyzed hydroformylation. And um, it is one of the sort of blockbuster organometallic catalysis reactions. Um, these are slightly old numbers, so it's probably gone up a little bit, but um, the worldwide capacity is in excess of 10,000 kilotons per annum. Um, it's the biggest industrial use of homogeneous catalysis, or at least it was when I looked up the numbers. Um, more than 60% of the rhodium hydroformylation reactions use modified rhodium phosphine ligand complexes. Um, and it's quite a complicated catalytic cycle um, where the key step, and that could be rate determining um, if you've got a larger alkene, it can also be selectivity determining, actually depends on an interplay of the conditions that are being used. Um, so we started having a look at this quite some time ago um, with a very talented undergraduate student, Helen Skinner. And um, what we were interested in at the time was to compare triphenylphosphine and um, trisphenylphosphide, so phosphine and the phosphide. And generally the consensus was that a phosphine is a sort of slow and steady catalyst, whereas the phosphide is fast, but, but it's, it's a lot more fragile as well. Um, and we started out really by calculating the, the catalytic cycle. Um, so here it is with triphenylphosphine, comparing a situation where one or two ligands are phosphorus donor ligands. And um, it starts out with um, alkene coordination and then insertion of the alkene into the rhodium hydrogen bond. Um, and that proceeds with a reasonable barrier. These numbers at the moment are in kilocalories per mole. Um, and then you have a CO insertion step. And again, that proceeds with quite a reasonable barrier. And then there's an oxidative addition and the reductive elimination step. And together, they're sometimes called the hydro hydrogenolysis step as well. Um, and you can see that for two phosphines here, the barrier is starting to be a bit high. They run at fairly toasty um, conditions at fairly toasty temperatures, so you might actually be able to overcome this. Um, but what you hopefully can also see is that um, the, the key step 
varies a little bit and um, these barriers in particular are pretty close to each other so it doesn't take very much in terms of changing the ligand or in terms of changing the reaction conditions to actually um, change which of the ligands has the highest um, which of the steps of the catalysis has the highest barrier um, and it we found it relatively hard to find detailed kinetic studies, um, but we found one for this particular ligand. And um, the study suggested that decatalysis is actually inhibited by excess phosphine being present. And the reaction conditions forced it in this case to be mainly in the monophosphine regime. Um, and they found an activation energy of about 18 kcal per mole and postulated that it was transition state one. And if you look at the monophosphorus um, energy differences here, our computational predictions are incredibly close on transition state one and transition state four. But we're actually not far off the experimental data if it is indeed that, um, that carb that, that alkene insertion. Um, we also, as I said, were interested to add um, how this compares to the phosphite. And um, we had a look at this one here. And again, you can see these barriers are pretty achievable. Um, and in this case, they're also much, much more similar to each other. And here, perhaps um, a little more clearly for both the mono and the bisligated phosphorus donor regime, um, the highest barrier is actually in this transition state for. Um, we found a kinetic study in this case, and the postulate there was that the re reaction conditions were mainly favoring a monophosphide regime, and the likely highest barrier was in this last step, the so-called hydrogenolysis. So we, we're doing okay computationally, but um, it is quite hard to, to make these distinctions. Um, my colleague here in Bristol, Paul Pringle, um, then had some interesting experimental observations that suggested that um, with some types of ligands, we might actually need to go up and add a third phosphorus donor ligand to it. And, um, and in that summer, I had a very talented undergraduate summer student working with me, Tom Young. He's just submitted his PhD thesis, or so Twitter says, so he's come a long way since this work. Um, but Tom looked at the energetic balance between different five coordinate intermediates um, and um, both the coordination geometry, but also the number of ligands that, that would be favored. And at that time, this was, and this still is, it's a reasonable level of DFT. So the, these are pretty decent numbers. And as you can see, at least for the very small trimethyl phosphide, um, it looks very much like um, a trisligated or a trisphosphorus donor ligated regime might actually be energetically accessible. Um, and Tom then extended this work to calculate that um, catalytic cycle, that energy profile with one, two, and three. Um, trimethylphosphite ligands, and I, I, I completely agree, this is a big and complicated diagram, um, but the key take home messages here is that these energy profiles cross, which suggests that if there's some lability in the coordination sphere, you may well find the catalytic system taking the lowest energy pathway, um, and again, all of these are actually energetically accessible. Um, so at the moment, Paul Pringle and I share um, a master's by research student, Maddie Newby, um, and she's been looking at fluorophosphides. Um, and there are some fluorophosphides that um, have been used in industry and that are pretty good hydroformylation catalysts. And again, from the experimental insights in Paul's group, it looked very much like um, we might actually, at least in some steps, go up to having three of these fluorophosphide type ligands on there. So Maddie has again calculated these energy profiles. And again, it's mightily complicated, but your key take home message here is that they're all very similar in energy. Um, they are all energetic accessible. In this particular case, it looks like the tris phosphide um, ligated pathway is actually the, um, 
the, the lowest energy pathway, but they're very, very close. And again, you can see how just minor changes to the reaction conditions may well change that preference. So we're looking at a really challenging mechanistic manifold in this case. Um, so computationally, we, we can deal with this. It is a lot of work um, and that makes it much, much harder to actually make predictions on, on a larger scale. Um, something else we've done in my group and more widely in Bristol, so I didn't start this work to map chemical space, but, but I've certainly ended up with it, um, is to actually find things that are easier to calculate than mapping out an entire catalytic cycle um, and using parameters to make predictions. Um, so what we've got, and it wasn't me, it was Guy Open who named this, are so-called ligand knowledge bases. And the underlying idea is that in organometallic catalysis, we have this long tradition of um, characterizing ligands with relatively simple parameters. Um, and the most straightforward characterization really started with Tolman in the 70s, where he proposed um, a steric parameter, in this case, the so-called cone angle, and also an electronic parameter, which, which I'll come to in a minute, but um, it's a carbonyl stretch it, um, detected by infrared spectroscopy. Um, and um, what Tolman showed quite early on was that there are some experimental measurables that um, are described quite well by these parameters. So in this case, for example, we're looking at the 31 phosphorus chemical shift on ligand coordination for this transrhodium complex. Um, and you can see that the relationship between this, this experimental measurable and the cone angle is actually described really well by a straight line relationship. Um, so what you can do with these types of parameters really is to then begin to derive structure property relationships. Um, and as I'll show you in a minute, you can also use them to actually map out ligand properties. Um, and this is at the very big of this rather epic chem ref. I say rather epic, we wrote a longer one um, later on ourselves. Um, but um, Tolman actually plotted the cone angle against what is now called the Tolman electronic parameter. And what you can see here is that each of the ligands considered has its own spot. And the ligands we would consider as chemically quite similar to each other are relatively close to each other in chemical space. And things that perhaps we might consider intuitively as very different from each other are a long way apart. And that's really an idea that carries through um, more complicated statistical approaches for clustering data. So. Um, Ligands that have similar properties should, if we've got the parameters right, show up close to each other in chemical space. And if they have very different parameters, um, then they'll be a long way apart. Um, one of the problems with this is that if you're using experimental parameters, um, then you need to be able to actually make the complexes to measure them. And the nickel complexes that were used for Tolman parameters are nowadays classified as quite highly toxic and carcinogenic. So you might not want to touch them. Um, and also whether they're necessarily reliable. So um, there are some problems with how the steric parameter is measured, but also some of the nickel complexes react in, in interesting ways. And you may not necessarily be able to make the right nickel complex to actually measure your data on. Another question that um, every, well, we and others started to ask was whether two dimensions really maps onto our understanding of organometallic catalysis, where quite frequently we look at the balance between sigma donation and pi acceptance, um, and also the modulation of these effects by steric interactions. So if you have a very large ligand, it might be a fantastic donor, but if sterically it cannot approach the metal center as well, the donation is actually modulated down as well. Another question is this idea of sampling the ligand space, and I'll come back to that later on, but you can see there are big areas here where there was no known ligand. Um, and then also the transferability to other ligand types. So when people started to get interested in N-heterocyclic carbines, they essentially found that especially the Tolman electronic parameter measured on a nickel tricarbonyl phosphine complex. If you created the same complex with a carbine, um, you would see almost no ligand related variation in that carbonyl stretch. So they were almost invariant. And people then moved on to proposing 
using different um, electronic parameters to work better with um, carbenes, for example. So um, one of the, we we we've done a lot of work in Bristol on ligand parameters, and um, I decided today to talk about bidentate phosphorus phosphorus, and to some extent also phosphorus nitrogen donor ligands. Um, and what we've done here is um, optimize the ligands as free ligands and also in a binding configuration. Um, we did some work to truncate the ligands to determine the homo, lumo and proton affinity energies for each of the donor atoms on their own. Um, we calculated the ligands coordinated to a zinc dichloride fragment, which has no crystal field stabilization energy and is essentially acting as a Lewis acid just to force the ligand to be in the binding conformation. And then a palladium dichloride, palladium two fragment, where um, you have quite a strong preference for a square planar coordination. We also looked at higher coordination numbers, but it actually turns out that this palladium complex gives us a reasonably good model for an octahedral complex without all of the pain and grief that sometimes happens for those calculations. Um, we also have a steric parameter, and it's essentially a wedge of helium atoms, where the helium atoms are sitting in positions that would be occupied by other ligands in an octahedral complex. And um, there, there are two flavors of this parameter, one where the ligand can adjust to the steric pressure of this octahedral, this mock octahedral um, environment, and the other one where it's held more rigidly at the um, bite angle you would find in the zinc fragment here. Long story short, you end up with 28 parameters extracted from, um, I think it's six or seven calculations. And um, they are quite highly correlated because they're for the same ligand in different coordination environments. And to make it easier to visualize this, um, we have tended to use principal component analysis, which is a projection technique um, that reduces the number of dimensions by transforming the original parameters. And it is specifically designed to capture that distance between objects. So again, coming towards a point where things that are similar to each other are quite close to each other in chemical space and things that are very different from each other are further apart. Um, so in principal component analysis, you describe the variation of the data in terms of new uncorrelated variables. So we're no longer looking for linear relationships. We're looking for comprehensive coverage. Um, these new parameters are linear correlation of the original data, and it performs essentially the algorithm performs a constrained optimization where you sort of realign your chemical space to get most of the variation on the first principal component, next highest amount on the second one, but with it being orthogonal. So there's no correlation between the principal components. Um, in practice, if you apply principal component analysis, um, here I'm showing you a map for 324 phosphorus phosphorus donor bidentate ligands. Um, and what you're seeing here, that's labeled incorrectly, um, but you're seeing two principal components um, which have the highest amount of variation between them and they capture about 58% of the variation and the information in the data set. It's worth bearing in mind that principal component analysis, if you put 28 parameters in, you're going to get 28 parameters out as well. Um, it's just they become less and less important. The spots on the map are color coded according to the substituents on our phosphorus uh, on, on the backbone. Um, and um, you can see that the ligand space for alkyl substituted ligands is sampled reasonably well. Aryl um, phosphorus phosphorus donor ligands are sampled. There are a few phosphite and phosphonite and phosphinite ones um, and a few slightly more unusual ones. But there are also these big gaps in, in the chemical space. So overall, there isn't actually that much variation in that chemical space. And we, we had a crazy summer quite some time ago where we thought, OK, we, we've got big computers. What can we do with this? Um, so we decided to treat the ligands like Lego bricks. Um, we kept the donors the same, but we changed the substituents and also the backbone. And we sampled 11 different substituents and we combined them with 25 different backbones. 
Um, so if you look at the map that results from this analysis here, um, fundamentally, again, what you're seeing is color coding by the substituents in this case, um, and they are clustering together according to those substituents, but there is some diagonal spread and that, that comes from the variation introduced by the backbones. I've tried color coding with 25 different colors and it looks a mess. Um, so what I've done here instead is color coded the same map, but this time by the length of the backbone. And what you can start to see here again is these diagonals um, offset by, by 90 degrees compared to the substituent effects. Um, and what you also can start to see is that um, five and six membered backbones, so very, very long backbones are actually very, very flexible. So you're starting to lose the trends on that one. The five membered ones still um, cluster, the six membered ones are starting to show up everywhere. And that's basically because the backbone in most cases is so flexible that the ligand can actually adjust to the coordination environment here. So what we've shown with this is that um, it's not just the backbones that give variation in the chemical space, but also changing the substituents. Um, and I've just projected these two types of bidentate ligand maps onto each other. So the full spots were the original map. It's a mirror image, which happens with principal component analysis. Um, and then the open spots are the systematically sampled ones treated in the same way. And you can see there's certainly scope here for actually improving the variation in chemical space as well. And um, if I just go back to these references here, um, we did some work with Stephen Mansell's group in Harriet Watt um, to actually look at more exotic ligands um, and ligands that have the phosphorus as part of an aromatic ring here. And that's one step towards improving the sampling. Okay, so we also were interested then in finding out whether you can combine um, more varied donor sets. Um, and here we use the same descriptors, apart from the split ligand descriptors that I mentioned briefly, um, with a much wider range of bidentate ligands. And we looked at carbenes combined, combined with a different second donors nitrogen, 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 oxygen, and oxygen, oxygen donor ligands, and then also both phosphorus, 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 oxygen, and phosphorus, nitrogen distances. And what you're seeing here, again, is that um, the distribution across chemical space is initially dominated by the donor atoms. Um, so the phosphenes, anything involving a phosphorus is sort of up, away up towards the top a little bit. Um, nitrogen, 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 oxygen, and oxygen, oxygen cluster together in this representation. And then the carbenes are um, in a cluster of, of their own as well. Um, I've color coded again here by backbone length, and it's not quite as clean and clear cut. Um, and there, there is this breakaway faction here, which are um, charged ligands. But again, you can see a degree of clustering to this, but this ligand space isn't sampled as well as the um, database we, we constructed separately. Um, so if you go about it carefully, you can actually compare different donors. Um, and one of the things we've been interested in is to compare um, the first main group element row, essentially. So taking out anything involving phosphorus and looking at these carbene-based ligands that um, my collaborators in, in, in Leeds have done quite a lot of work with. And then also this area here to explore whether they continue to overlap if you take away the big variation that's introduced by phosphorus donors. Um, and the answer is yes, you, you still see that um, overlap and it actually maps quite well onto what we know about copper catalysis, um, where the different types of ligands are used interchangeably and where potentially also some amino alcohol substrates can act as ligands rather than um, your carefully chosen ligand system in there. Um, 
So another area, and remember we're talking about the big wheel here, is to, to actually look at reactivity. Um, and one of the things you can do with these types of ligand maps is you can carefully select the ligands you're doing um, calculations on to actually sample your chemical space. Um, so I'm showing you here some of the ligands we've calculated for hydroformylation again, um, just to show that they actually cover quite a lot of the monodentate ligand space. Um, and then we've zoomed in here on the bidentate ligand space, but again, looking at different ligand variations just to make sure we're sampling a reasonably broad area of chemistry. And for hydroformylation, um, I, I've actually gone through, there's a few missing here if you're quite eagle-eyed, um, but I've gone through most of them, calculated the entire catalytic cycle and the barriers here. And we can then start to actually link this to our ligand descriptors and see what are the dominant effects. Um, so for some of these ligands, there is a relatively weak correlation between the highest barrier in the cycle and the steric size of the ligand. Um, and then there is also a quite weak correlation, but it's got some very clear outliers, which is causing problems here, um, between the energy of the LUMO, which you would think of as the orbital accepting pi backbonding on, uh, in, in a phosphine potentially, um, and again, the highest barrier across the cycle. So um, that really just is to show how we're starting to link the work we've done on ligands um, with mechanistic calculations and exploring catalytic cycles. And um, recently, and the postdoc funded by this project is planning to start next month. Um, so we've got a catalysis hub project looking at um, rhodium complexes of these types of fluorophosphide ligands. Um, and you can perhaps just recall that um, Maddie's system was a variation on these fluorophosphides as well. Um, and what we're going to do there is to combine our ligand databases, mechanistic calculations um, with in operando measurements and characterization of the active catalysts to really try and pin down what's the number of ligands on these systems. And you can see it's um, it's quite a large team of people involved. Unfortunately, Paul Karma died last year, um, but um, we, we are going to continue with this work and it will be very much in his honor. He played a really big part in developing this project as well. Um, so we've not just looked at ligands, we've gone beyond ligands um, and um, I've done some work in a collaboration um, with my very good friend and collaborator, collaborator Jason Lynham in um, York. And in Jason's group, they have a long-standing interest in alkynes and vanillidines, um, which are tautomers of each other. And one of the key motivations there is that depending on whether the system is um, coordinating as an alkyne, so E to 2 sidon, or as a vanillidine enton, um, that allows you to modify the selectivity of reactions. So it becomes quite interesting from an organometallic synthetic point of view to try and find what conditions you need to favor one tautomer over the other one. And when we started this work, um, gold alkynes, uh, sorry, gold vanillidines were postulated as intermediates in, in these ring closing um, reactions. And they, they were certainly shown to be viable computationally, but there was no experimental evidence for this. Um, and I should also say the calculations that people were doing at the time were on very small systems um, and model systems, not um, going the whole hog to Iper and Brett Foster ligands. Um, so we thought, well, we, we could maybe have a look at these tautomers and map out the chemical space there. Um, and the first thing we had a look at was the substituent effect on that alkyne vanillidine tautomeric pair. Um, so we ran calculations initially in three metal complexes, as well as for the free alkyne and vanillidine. So we had a gold one complex, a rhodium one complex, and um, also this um, square-based pyramidal ruthenium complex. 
And from these calculations, we extracted, again, quite a lot of data. There's a bit of a theme emerging here for my group. Um, and one of the things we were particularly interested in was that energy difference between the vanilladine and the alkyne in these different metal complexes. Um, but we pulled out a, a lot extra data as well. And what we've ended up with then were 35 parameters. Um, and again, because they're for these tautomeric pairs, they were reasonably high correlated. Um, so one of the early analysis we did, and I, I, I've not stopped being ridiculously pleased with this, even though the work is quite a long time ago. Um, so here is a plot um, that has the energy difference between the vanilladine and the alkyne for the gold complex on the x-axis and for the rhodium and ruthenium complexes on the y-axis. And um, what you can see, first of all, is that it's the same trend and the metal complex just moves the um, where that line actually falls. But um, the sub substrates, the alkyne and vanilladine substituents play a really big role in determining that energy difference um, and the trends in that energy difference. Um, the other things you can see, so for the gold chloride fragment, it's only one alkyne vanilladine pair, and that's the one that's difluorinated, um, which favors the vanilladine. Everything else is going to go for the alkyne. For the ruthenium fragment, on the other hand, which is, don't, don't let me lie, the blue line, it's all down here. Um, the vanilladine form is strongly favored, and that's absolutely in line with experimental data. And then for the rhodium system, you can actually see it crossing the x-axis. So there are mixed preferences depending on the substituents on, on, on this tautomeric pair. Um, and that's broadly in line with experimental observations. Um, so what we're seeing here is the same trend, but with different metals. Um, and we're starting with this to explore metal effect. Um, obviously, I couldn't help myself. And we did a principal component analysis as well. And that gives you a map like this. In this case, it's color coded by the energy difference, again, between the vanilladine and the alkyne form. Um, and you can again see that the different types of substituents lead to clustering um, with the fluorine fluorine substituted one favoring the vanilladine a lot and others come having a lesser preference. They all actually favor for, for the ruthenium case. Um, so we thought, well, these were a lot of calculations. We can't really explore chemical space on this scale much further. But what we can do, again, is to use our map of this substrate, alkyne vanilladine space, to select systems that sample that space well. And doing this, we picked six pairs that, that we wanted to look at a little bit more. And as you can see, they're spread reasonably well. They, they sort of touch on the main clusters in terms of the chemistry. Um, so we wanted to broaden our understanding of metal effects and um, looked at a range of complexes to get some of the trends across the periodic table and down the groups in the periodic table. Um, so we looked at this chromium and, and this moly um, complex, and both of them show a small preference on average for the alkyne. The large error bars come about because the fluorine-fluorine system always prefers the vanilladine, by the way. Um, we played a similar game going across groups between manganese and ruthenium, for example. We looked at ruthenium complexes in a bit more detail, and we already had that square-based pyramidal ruthenium complex complex here. Um, we also looked at comparing palladium and platinum systems, um, played with platinum and then the, the sort of more valuable metals a little bit. And because we were ultimately interested in stabilizing the gold vanilladine complexes, we went to town there a little bit with, with different types of ligands. And um, the bad news is that um, for, for all of the gold systems, the preference for the alkyne is actually very, very strong indeed. Um, if uh, just to show you, if we just narrow this down to one of the pairs, it's basically the same trend. Um, it, it is maintained. It's just the fluorine fluorine inclusion brings us these big error bars. 
Um, because I do ligands, we also looked at ligands effects and um, we varied the ligand from electron poor to electron rich in these two sets of ruthenium complexes. And you can see these very, very nice trends where you can actually use the spectator ligands to modulate that energy balance between the tautomo preferences as well. Um, so we, we pulled all of this together. It was quite a big project and said, OK, so can we come up with a recipe for stabilizing vanillidines by choice of metal centers? Um, and essentially from all of this data analysis, what you find is that on your alkyne van or vanillidine system, you need electron withdrawing substituents. Um, ruthenium 2D6 metal centers, um, and especially the square-based pyramidal geometry are especially promising. Um, and you also need electron donating ligands on the metal center to favor the vanillidine. And both of those observations come back to saying vanillidines are stabilized by pi back bonding. Um, the effects are clouded a little bit by steric effects um, because larger ligands um, prefer the vanillidine form because it's further away from the metal center as well. Um, so we can actually explore multiple variables in the systematic ways and we can look at the um, interactions between these variables and um, we can also um, actually support the prediction and capture this balance of different effects by looking at the data as well. Okay, so can we stabilize gold vanillidines? Um, we had one result that looked a little bit more promising than what I've showed you so far. And that was for the mixed hydrogen methyl substituted system. Um, and Jason makes me do my energies in kilojoules rather than kcal. So these are now in kilojoules, slight, slightly bigger looking. Um, and for all of these systems, the computer was indicating quite strongly that the alkyne was favored. Um, for this slightly weird pincer ligand system, we were at an energy level where actually um, you are in the computational noise and it might be worth exploring a little bit further. Um, so we got a little bit of funding from York Seed Corn Project Fund to actually make these pincer ligands and explore their coordination chemistry a little bit further. Um, and even at the time we were, uh, well, what Jason wanted to do was to explore whether two different metal centers combined could help to stabilize the vanillidine form. Um, so the idea was to have a system, a mixed system with a cyclopentadienyl ruthenium and a gold triphenylphosphine, a um, homogeneous system with two gold centers and then the mixed system combining this weird pincer ligand um, with triphenylphosphine as well. And um, what you can do is just think about this as a continuum of different geometries, where on one side you've got the vanillidine and then your M2 metal complex sort of slides there and you can have a sigma pi system and you could also have a gem coordination of, of these different things. And um, we calculated the energy differences. And um, for the ruthenium system, which is known to be good at stabilizing vanillidines, the preference was quite clearly for the vanillidine. Um, for the gold homogeneously substituted one, um, didn't look good. Um, for this mixed system with our pincer ligand, the energy differences were coming down, but um, we also had problems with those calculations. So we thought, well, we've got the money, let's give it a go. Um, so Jason's, I think she was a student or postdoc at the time, Louisa, um, did some work and managed to see this um, sigma pi Di gold complex. And then if you left that sitting around carelessly, the reaction actually went on. And we ended up with this tri-nuclear gold complex, um, which hadn't been seen before, which is not something we've um, considered in our calculations. And it's stabilized by having pi pi stacking between these um, pincer type ligands, basically. So we then realized that our predictions were limited because we didn't know that chemistry would come and do something else. Um, but we regrouped and we thought, is this just because the pincer ligand is quite unusual? 
and we calculated energy difference between the sort of sigma pi and diorate complexes and found that it's not because the ligand is, is very special, um, but even for the di gold triphenylphosphine system, you are within an energy difference here that makes you think it's worth looking for. And um, Jason's group did some really interesting mass spec work and looked at incredibly heavy masses um, for the gold system and they found it. So it is at least transiently present for other types of ligands as well. So um, there is a clear role for interacting with experiments, I, I would argue, even for this highly data-led prediction. Okay, so um, we got beat as well. Other people managed to produce experimental evidence for gold vanilladines taking a slightly different route. Um, but it also inspired us to say, okay, can we go up in scale? Can we try um, a computational prediction of reactivity? If we map out all of the mechanistic pathways we know, can we actually go there with something like that? Um, and we've called it the Bristol and York, but the Y is silent, reactivity and catalysis knowledge base, um, abbreviated to BRIC. Um, and the idea is to use this rhodium system here to explore substrate effects on barriers and then start to modify metals and ligands and to actually go and test this experimentally. Um, and this was work largely done by Derek Durant, and this is very much a too many chiefs and only one Indian situation. I'll show you some of Derek's work. Um, so what we wanted to do was to look at the coupling of substrates with a double bond um, with the, what we've called XY substrates, where um, we, we're showing the bonds that we are hypothetically breaking. Um, and here is a cycle um, just to show you that there are two competing pathways for the oxidative addition in this case. Um, with some of the substrates, you also have competing pathways for the later steps of your catalytic cycle. Um, but in one version, you calculate your, uh, you coordinate your alkene first, bring in dihydrogen, and then oxidatively add this. Or you start out with the solvent and dihydrogen, um, add the dihydrogen across onto the rhodium, and then bring in the alkene and continue along your pathway. Um, so Derek has done an absolute heroic mountain of calculations, and um, this is the, the sort of potted summary of his work. Um, just for example, looking at the oxidative addition step here and comparing the relative barriers to activation, the free energy barriers um, across different um, types of double bonded species and then also different substrates. And if you analyze this a little bit more, this quite strongly relates to the bond strength in this case. Um, we can then also look at this in a slightly different way. So we've essentially flipped this um, and you can see quite clear substrate effects um, for the different types of um, substrate combinations. And um, you can then also relate this to the trans influence of, of what is actually trans across to the bond you're trying to activate. Um, so just going back to this, um, our cutoff is roughly here. So it actually also shows us that only a few of these substrates can be activated by this catalyst. Um, and that then relates to these bond strengths. Um, going on to the migratory insertion, none of these barriers are particularly troubling, um, but there aren't really any obvious trends in um, substrate properties as well. Um, it's not usually the rate limiting step in this type of catalysis. And then moving on to the reductive elimination, um, most of these systems have already been ruled out because you can't actually get over the oxidative addition barrier, um, but assuming they could proceed, um, you're seeing some here that are at a viable energy level, um, and we can pull out um, the CO, which is a little bit more complicated and gets a little bit more messy, and just look at ethene and acetylene. And what you're seeing here is that there are some trends and some clear clustering um, where the larger substrates are more difficult to actually undergo this reductive elimination. Um, so we're starting to see the beginnings of a steric trend, but that data set really isn't diverse enough yet. 
Um, one of the things that we did see was that hydrosilylation was in an energetically accessible window and um, with COVID restrictions gradually being lifted, I, I actually dispatched Derek to do some work in the lab as well. Um, and the idea was to look at the hydrosilylation of these long chain alkenes. Um, hoping to just see that bond activation. But what you can also see is a double bond migration. And I, I love these plots, um, but please don't ask me many questions about this. Um, I'm hoping Derek is in the audience if you have any to, to rescue us. Um, but what we were hoping to see would be um, the alkene turning into an alkane, so hydrogenating those bonds. Um, and what you're seeing instead is that um, the starting material is certainly being activated, but you start, so, so you're losing um, some of these peaks and you're starting to see these um, double migration programs, come, um, programs, products come into it uh, as well. And the NMR system actually becomes much, much more complicated. Um, and the same is true if you go to one octane, but it actually gets even more messy. Um, so our computational predictions there don't really match the experimental outcomes. There are extra reactions going on. Um, and as a sideline also, predicting the selectivity of these types of reactions and the balance between these different competing steps is very, very hard. So Derek is coming towards the end of his project, um, but what we're also trying to do now is to introduce these additional, these competing steps to our databases and see where we're doing in balancing the different steps and tightening the, the um, predictions a little bit against this. I'm going to skip over this in terms of um, time. And um, I just wanted to mention that um, Christmas did come a little bit early last year. So I'm also um, involved and actually um, leading on another catalysis hub project, this time under the Science One heading. And the idea is to combine our ligand databases, which give you predictions of reactivity with enantiose selectivity predictions. And they're incredibly hard with the approach we're using, but per Ola Norby has been working on this for many, many years. And um, what we're trying to do is actually integrate the two data let approaches. And that should then hopefully allow us not just to predict reactivity and selectivity in isolation, but actually combine the two systems as well. So that, that's still very much in the beginning, but I wanted to mention this project as well. So what, what I've tried to show you today is that um, we are on the way towards making predictions. Um, there, there are pitfalls and diversions along the way, but, but we're still certainly starting to have something that looks like a wheel. Um, so in terms of mechanism, what I've showed you today was that we can do this on a relatively large scale and with um, quite high amounts of patience, we can also begin to explore the mechanistic manifold. And as we get experimental insights into this, we can add additional pathways. So if there is actually double bond migration, then again, you can capture this computationally. In terms of ligand effects, we've done a lot of work in Bristol to map ligand space, and I've showed you some examples of linking that to mechanism. And um, in some cases, we can also use it to suggest and guide experiments. Um, in terms of substrates, the alkyne and vanilladine work was a mixture, but, but it was very specific to that one tautomeric pair. And what I've just skipped over was a more general attempt at um, mapping substrate space. So I've got to apologize to Derek later on again for skipping over this. Um, but um, they can link to mechanism as well. And Derek's work is starting to build a framework for this. Um, and also for capturing the interactions between substrates substrates, ligands, mechanism. Um, and then I've touched on this a little bit in the context of the alkyne and vanilladine project. Um, we've done some more work on this recently to actually map metal effects and also begin to map the interactions between the catalyst backbone, the active metal center, and other variables that you might be able to control experimentally. 
Um, at the heart of all of this is data, really, and um, seeking to access experimental data of high quality that probes the mechanism, but also providing that underpinning of calculated data and pulling this together to start to, to make some predictions. Um, and that's pretty much all I wanted to talk about. So I've got a, a massive thank you slide. Lots and lots of people have been involved in the different project strands, have contributed ideas, data, suggestions, analysis. Um, and um, I've talked about these interactions throughout this talk. So with this, I'm going to finish and I'd be very happy to take your questions at this moment in time. Thank you very much again for having me. Many thanks, uh, Natalie, for a really, really fascinating talk. Um, we've got some questions coming in already. Sure. Um, Lara would like to know, is the model able to predict on the activation energy of the catalytical cycle? Yes, we, 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 we can certainly do that. Um, our problem is a little bit what data you train it on. Um, so the DFT data is a bit noisy. And um, as I hinted with Derek's work, that there, there are competing pathways. The same is true about the hydroformylation. But you can train a model based on ligand descriptors um, using these calculated barriers as, as a response, and then actually go ahead and predict for the entirety of ligand space as well. Thank you. Um, Julia would like to know what well, she says. Thank you for the talk and very impressive work. Um, do you, have you tried to evaluate some relationships between ligand effects and selectivity, as for example, with, in hydroformulation? Um, we've had a problem with hydroformulation, which is that when you go to propene as your alkene substrate, um, there are you, you suddenly get this this but well, it's almost like a combinatorial explosion you get lots of isomers lots of conformers and dft on its own is too noisy to get that selectivity prediction so the catalysis hub funded project that i mentioned at the end um, what we're planning to do there is to use per Olin norby's approach which essentially has he trains molecular mechanics force fields to reliably evaluate conformers and isomers um, and just looks at that delta delta G for the selectivity determining step. Um, and they lose the overall barrier in, in those models. So that's how they come a cropper. But to combine it with the ligand knowledge base predictions and detailed mechanistic insights into the barrier height and then put that selectivity prediction having fully evaluated all of the possible conformers and isomers, so, so you get that delta delta G on the selectivity determining step spot on and come up with a master equation that combines both reactivity and selectivity. That's the plan. But um, there is an awful lot of work that actually goes into training the force fields and trying the selectivity predictions. Um, and even if we just wanted to look at the regio selectivity, because the DFT is a little bit noisy and there are so many possibilities, especially if you've got quite floppy ligands, you wouldn't trust the numbers otherwise, I'm afraid. Um, so Habib has a question. Um, he's an experimental PhD researcher who's trying to learn more about calculations. Sure. Um, and he asks, um, sort of what software would you recommend um, and if they want to predict the mechanism and want to find a transition state for a reaction, I'm assuming that's what TS means. Yes. What models are best to use? Oh, um, <laughs> hundreds of papers have been written about this, um, which tells you that no one really agrees. So in terms of software, any electronic structure code can um, be used to characterize the ground states and also the, the transition state geometries. Um, some of them have slightly better algorithms for finding the transition state than, than others. Um, in my group, and um, I don't think I'm giving anything away, but, but we tend towards using Jaguar because we like that it's fast and um, it has a really nice algorithm for the transition state. Um, quite a lot of work. We, we also use Gaussian for, um, but, but, you know, there are tons of other packages available and it, it is slightly tied to what you spend your pennies on. Um, and um, some of them are a little bit faster. Jaguar has quite a robust mechanism for actually 
defining transition states. And um, especially if you do these sort of high throughput calculations, um, you, you find that um, to be able to patch things together like Lego bricks, you could need, need a good search algorithm, otherwise you're in trouble. Um, but you can do it with any software package, so don't sweat that bit. Um, as a card carrying computational chemist, I should now give you a lengthy explanation of different functionals and which ones we like and stuff like that. Um, it doesn't matter at the end of the day. None of them are perfect. All of them are a little bit noisy. What you need to look out for is um, if you are looking at finely balanced competing steps, then you need to prove to the community that your predictions and your analysis are not going to change substantially if you make a minor change to the computational approach. If they do, go back to the lab and get us some experimental proof. That is far better than evaluating hundreds of thousands of density functionals. That, that would be my advice for, for a beginner. But there's tons of papers out there with lots of information as well. Thank you. Um, and Michael asks um, a question on the first part of the phosphites. Yep. PO3, uh, POR3. Yep. These are a conformational nightmare, especially yep. if you have several of them present. How did you deal with a large number of possible conformers to explore? So we do do conformational searching. Um, and it's done with molecular mechanics with some constraints because we didn't feel like fitting better force fields in this case. That then means that there is no guarantee that your potential energy surface from molecular mechanics matches that at a higher level of theory at the DFT approach. So what you do is you take a subset of conformers and you don't just take the lowest energy ones. You, you do a bit of sampling and you look at them quite carefully and then you run them all with DFT. Um, what we normally assume is that um, there is not substantial conformational change between the intermediate and the transition state. So once we found the low energy intermediates, we then go and find a transition state that connects them together. In the case of hydroformylation, I haven't put this in because it's seriously geeky. Um, but for a C3 symmetrical ligand, um, you can actually, by symmetry arguments, find that there are seven possible conformations um, for, for all of the C3 symmetrical ligands. And for some of the ones we looked at for hydroformylation, I ran the catalytic cycle with all seven of them. To try and pin down this idea, do we have a high energy conformer that is actually much, much more reactive than the low energy one? And the short and troubling answer is we probably do. Um, and um, they are the ones um, that have an anti-anti-gauche arrangement of the three arms on a phosphide. And if you actually look at some of the commercially used ligands, they are pinned back. So they have that same conformation, um, but, but then have a tie on the backbone as well. So you've stopped the conformational freedom and you hold it there um, and they, they make for pretty good catalysts. Um, so yeah, you're absolutely right. There, there is a lot of work there. Um, what, what I tend to do is show the low intermediate um, conformer pathway and, and gloss over the rest. Um, it actually turns out that on any of them, they are pretty good catalysts as well. So when they fail as catalysts, the reasons are likely somewhere else. And that might be in speciation or that might be in ligand hydrolysis rather than in, in that mechanistic aspect. Um, so if you do this for a long time, you learn to squint, tilt your head and say, this is roughly right, rather than trying to really pin down the fine balance. And there's one final question um, from Nico, who's asking about sort of practicalities and what are the timescales for performing a, a prediction? Could he run to the lab and start a reaction and start a prediction at the same time? Um, it depends what you want to base your prediction on. So a computational mechanistic study across a multitude of ligands and substrates and metals is a big deal. Um, and Derek's been doing this for most of his PhD. And, and I showed you the results in about three slides. So that, that is hard work. 
what we're trying to do in my group is to build the foundations and a workflow for how you could go about this, um, always with an eye on being transferable. So the rhodium cationic complex we use is, is a pretty crappy catalyst, but it eats quite a lot of stuff. And that's absolutely on purpose because we're actually interested in what are the trends, what, what are the parameters. And the next phase of that then is to bring in the ligand maps, the substrate maps, and begin to train models that tell you something about the rest of chemical space. So you'll have seen I was selecting quite carefully to sample different chemistries um, to then do the hard work on the mechanism. Um, and the theory, and um, we haven't got enough data, is that if you're in a similar area of chemical space, if you've got a good local model, then other systems that have similar properties will behave in the same way. And so you can make predictions. And that's how we're going to get these computational predictions onto a time scale where you can match them with your lab work. But there is still quite quite a lot of work to do. So when, when you ask, are we nearly there yet? I'm afraid the answer is still not. But, but um, we have a much better idea about what we need to do to get there um, and what the, the sticking points are that we need to address. And my advice would be do good experiments because actually tensioning the calculations against the experiments is a really important part of that process as well. Thank you. Um, Looking at the time, I will I will say that's the last question and thank Natalie again for a really fascinating talk. You can tell by the, the questions how fascinating it was. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me and, and thanks everybody for listening. I know it's getting warm. Yeah. Um, enjoy the British summer while it lasts and I hope you can join us at our UK Catalysis Hub uh, conference and um, event on EDI, which is Catalysis in a Diverse World, next week. Um, they should both be good um, conferences to come along to. Um, and if you go to our website, you can see our future webinars. Thank you again, Natalie. My pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>